Hello, everyone here on Free Code Camp today, and welcome to this course on NoSQL. My name is Anya Kuba, and I'm a software developer and course creator on YouTube, as well as your instructor for this video. In this video course, I will be demystifying what NoSQL is, clarifying the difference between SQL and NoSQL, as well as going into a deep dive of the four main types of NoSQL databases. With each deep dive, we will be approaching each learning as an explanation, example, and exercise. So the three E's in order to fully grasp the topic we are discussing. After that, we will go straight into using what we have learned with two real life use cases. By use cases, I mean we will be getting data into real life projects using a document API and the GraphQL API to communicate with our newly made databases. And finally, I will be wrapping up with where to go next. Don't worry if none of this makes sense to you now. This is what the tutorial is for. As always, if you like what we are doing here at Free Code Camp, please do give that subscribe button a click as it would really help us on our mission to provide a broad spectrum of learning materials right here, free to access for you. Now, let's get to it. So, the first thing you need to know is that NoSQL is an approach to database management. It is considered to be super flexible as it allows for a variety of data models, such as key value, document, Y column or tabular and graph formats. These are the four we will be looking at today as well as a new emerging trend of multi-model databases. So, we have already mentioned that NoSQL databases are casually considered to be flexible, but officially the defining characteristics of NoSQL databases are considered to be that they are non-relational, distributed, and scalable. Distributed refers to running on clusters of machines globally distributed to support apps at different geographical locations. And scalable means that NoSQL databases are able to store and query large-scale data, as well as support high transaction throughput scaling horizontally. In addition to this, they are also partition tolerant, meaning that they are able to work in the presence of network partitioning. And they are also highly available, meaning that they are able to serve requests even when some machines go down. They can do this as they have data replication built in. And lastly, what does non-relational entail? To understand this fully, we need to look at relational databases first. The relational data model and SQL were designed for databases that work on single machines and scale vertically. We will go into this in a bit more detail later on. In fact, everything we just mentioned is in contrast to what relational databases are all about, which is atomicity, consistency, isolation, durability, or ACID for short. I am bringing up relational databases as to understand where NoSQL came from, we have to look at them as well as SQL. SQL stands for Structured Query Language. It is used for relational databases. By relational, I mean it's a collection of tables with rows and columns that stores a specific set of structured data. NoSQL is used for non-relational and relational databases. Okay, so when you think SQL, think ah, the structured query language for database management on relational databases and think rigid. And when you think no SQL, well, let's have a look at the word itself, no SQL. You might think, okay, so it's the more flexible way to access data, so not using SQL, the structured query language. Simple, right? Well, you would actually be wrong. Because of the usefulness of SQL, many NoSQL databases added support for SQL, leading to an understanding among developers that NoSQL actually means not only SQL. So you can use the structured query language or you cannot use the structured query language. It is up to you. So once again, to recap, SQL is a structured query language and NoSQL is an approach to database management. Got it? Good. In the book, NoSQL Distilled, a brief guide to the emerging world of polyglot persistence, the writer explains two main reasons for using a NoSQL database. The first is application development productivity. When developing an app, there is a significant amount of time before starting anything really that is spent on organizing data. 
By organizing, I mean mapping data between in-memory data structures and a relational database. So in other words, a type of database that supports SQL, as we just mentioned. As a non-relational database manager approach, no SQL can provide a data model that better fits the application's need and in turn makes our life easier in the long run. As the data model is more suited to the application, it makes debugging and writing code easier, as well as allows for easy evolution. The second reason is large scale data. As we know, organizations today love to capture as much data as possible to improve their offerings, as well as other things. However, capturing large amounts of data and processing it quickly is expensive in terms of an operation. So whilst it is possible to do so with relational databases, it is usually more economic to run large data and processes on lots and lots of little cheaper machines or clusters that no SQL databases are designed to explicitly run on, rather than one large one as is typical for relational databases. We will go into this in more detail in the next section. So in conclusion, no SQL is a database management approach. The characteristics we can expect from a NoSQL database are that it is a non-relational database as opposed to a relational one, a distributed database that is designed to manage large-scale data while maintaining high performance, scalability, throughput and availability. Now, when people look at NoSQL and SQL, they might be tempted to compare the two. But by now, we know that we can't do this. Why again? This is because, once again, NoSQL is a database management approach and SQL is a query language. So two completely different things. It might be better going forward to start referring to NoSQL databases as non-relational databases. So let's go ahead and switch that so we can start comparing them to relational databases from now on. As we mentioned, relational databases use the structured query language, a language that became prominent in the late 1970s. And NoSQL means not only structured query language, which allows you to use the language or not use it to get data. NoSQL's appearance on the scene is noted as somewhere around the 2000s. With SQL, the data is modeled as tables with fixed columns and rows. And with NoSQL databases, the data is not only modeled as tables with fixed rows and columns. Instead, it can be modeled as JSON documents, graphs with nodes and edges, key value pairs, or with Y column or tabular databases, where columns can be dynamic from row to row within a table instead of fixed. With a NoSQL database, the schema is flexible. This means there doesn't have to be any real fixed structure to the data. It can be stored in a flexible schema way. This approach can make development easier due to the high level of flexibility. With a relational database, the schema is fixed. They will have rigid data types. So if you want to put a Boolean into a column that has been defined to only take integers, the attempt will get rejected. Think of it as a super strict approach. And whilst this strictness can be good, it also comes with its downfalls and can be very time consuming when trying to implement changes. And finally, let's look at scalability. No SQL usually scales out this is also known as horizontal scaling. This involves adding more and more machines to the resource pool, rather than adding resources by scaling vertically, like relational databases do. So while no SQL scales out, SQL scales up. By adding more resources, I mean it adds things like a more powerful CPU and RAM to handle workload and improve performance, rather than adding more machines such as servers. As mentioned, there are four main types of NoSQL database systems, each using a different data model. Once again, they are the key value, document, Y column or tabular and graph database types. As mentioned, we will be also taking a quick look at the emerging trend of the multi-model type at the end too. We will be going through each type in an explanation, example, exercise format. Okay, so once again, the three E's. Now, the first thing you need to know is that databases have multiple layers. The first layer is an interface, or in other words, a visual platform where you can visit and interact with data, which is where you find the format, the language, and the transport. In this course, the interface we are going to use is called DataSax Astra Database Management System. 
This is where we will be creating all of our database types for the example and exercise part. Datastax Astro DB is an auto-scaling database as a service built on Apache Cassandra, designed to simplify cloud-native application development. Because it is built on Apache Cassandra, you will see us using the Cassandra query language, or CQL, a few times in this course. CQL offers a model close to SQL in the sense that data is put in tables containing rows and columns. I will be pointing this out to you when we use it. These languages are how we interact with the data in our database. The next layer is an execution layer. This is where we pass the incoming queries coming from our interface. It is also used as an analyzer and a dispatcher. And finally, we have the storage layer in which the indexing of data happens. The reason I am using Datastax Astra is that it will allow us to create all four types of database types for this tutorial, so I won't have to sign up to separate database management systems for each section. However, you don't have to. There are literally dozens and dozens to choose from, so please feel free to take your pick. We can group these database management systems into families according to the CAP theorem. According to the CAP theorem, a NoSQL database cannot achieve consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. It must sacrifice one of the three. For example, MongoDB and Kafka chose to focus on CP, and the database management system we are going to be using, Datasax Astra, is built on Apache Cassandra, which chose to focus on AP. So, to recap, what we are doing here is using Datasax Astra, which is an interface essentially that will allow us to work with our NoSQL database, which is in this case Apache Cassandra. To be exact, Apache Cassandra is an open source NoSQL distributed database. The language we will use to communicate with our database is Cassandra Query Language, or CQL for short, which, as mentioned, is very similar to SQL. Most NoSQL databases have their own query language, but not all. Once you are on the Datastax Astra platform, we're going to create a database. So I'm just going to head over and click this button right here, and that will take me to the page in which I'm going to create our first database. Under database name, I'm going to call it FCC underscore tutorial. I would recommend calling your database exactly the same in order to avoid any issues further on for this tutorial. Of course, once you have the knowledge that you have gained after this tutorial, you will be able to name your databases anything you wish. This is just a suggestion, however. Now, under key space name, because the first example we're going to look at is tables, I'm going to call the key space tabula. Once again, I would recommend that you call your key space name the same thing so that you don't run into any issues further on. Okay, and next we can provide a region. We can choose Amazon Web Service or Microsoft Azure or Google Cloud. I'm just going to stick with this one and I'm just going to select Europe as I'm currently in Europe and I'm going to create a database. And there we go. We have created our first database. It has a database ID. The status is currently pending, so we're going to have to wait for that to turn active before we can go ahead and use the database. And there we go, we're active. As you can see here, the status has turned to active in green. Great. Now that we have set up our database management system, let's start getting to some examples. Okay, great. Now let's look at the first database type, which is a tabular database type, also known as a column database type or a wide column database type. What you need to know is that tables are relational and come with a schema. We are going to be making a table called books in this next section and defining what kind of rows the table can take and what kind of types the rows are made of. For example, I'm going to have a table called books and in it, I'm going to say that we can only have a row that has a book ID, an author, a title, a year of release, the categories the books belongs to and a timestamp for when it was added. I'm also going to say that the book ID needs to be a UUID or a universal unique identifier. The author field needs to be some text and the title needs to be some text too. The year needs to be an integer and the categories need to be a set of texts and the timestamp needs to be a type of timestamp format, and only that, okay? So what I have done here is essentially define a schema. 
The next thing that is important to know is that we are going to be saving this row based on a key. This is important as this is how we are going to be retrieving our data with queries later on. Okay, so for example, if my UUID for this row looks like this and I can save it, the only way I can find it is by searching for this key and the whole data row will be returned. This key is also what is known as a partition key. Because our NoSQL database is a distributed database, it means our data can be stored on loads and loads of different nodes. So if two rows have the same partition key, they will be stored together on one node. And when we query for that key, they will both return. Got it? Good. Now let's use it in practice with an example in which we are going to be storing books in a tabular database. So now that we have created the database and it's active to use, let's go ahead and create our first table. To do this, I'm just going to double click on the database itself. It should take you to this page in which you will see the key spaces associated with this database. At the moment, there is one as we only created one key space called tabula. Great. So now I'm going to do this part using the CQL console. So as we know, tabular databases organize data in rows and columns. OK, so that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be building a table with rows and columns to store some data using CQL or Cassandra query language. The first thing I'm going to do is use a command in order to get our key space. So to do this, I'm going to enter the following command. It is called describe key spaces. And if I hit that, you will see all the key spaces associated with my database. You will also see that tabula is right here. Just to make sure we are all on the same page, a key space is simply a word for a logical grouping of tables. So now that we can see our tabula key space, let's actually get to using it. I can use it using the following command, use tabula and just hit enter. Don't forget to put these semicolons at the end. OK, so now you will see that I'm actually in the tabular key space. I'm inside the key space. I now want to create a table inside the key space. And I'm going to use the following CQL command to do so. I'm going to write create table if not exists. OK, so that is something you're going to need to create a table in your key space. And I'm going to call the table books. Now, I'm going to actually define what goes into my table as well. I'm going to define what it is I want to put into my table and what type it is. OK, so for example, if I choose to put in a book ID, I'm then also going to state that this is a unique identifier. OK, so from now on, I can only use universally unique identifiers or UUID as the book ID. For those of you who don't know what a UUID is, it is a 128-bit label used for information in computer systems. I will show you the structure of it as well as what it looks like when we get to using it later on. Next, I'm also going to say that my table of books is going to have an author. And the author, so whatever value I have as the author, is going to be text. Okay, so a string in other words. We're also going to have a title, which is going to be text, a year, which is going to be an integer. OK, so a full number. We're going to have categories, which is a set of texts. OK, so once again, I will show you what that looks like. We're going to have multiple categories or in other words, it's going to be a set of texts. And I'm also going to have added, which is going to be a timestamp. I have defined added to be a timestamp. So timestamp is also a type in CQL. And finally, we're going to have a primary key. A primary key in basic terms is how we're going to search for a book in our table. OK, so imagine our table has hundreds and hundreds of books. We can filter through the table. We can search through the table by the book ID thanks to this primary key right here. The book ID that I've passed through into the primary key is also the partition key that we discussed earlier in the introduction. OK, so I'm putting in a partition key into the primary key. 
Great. And I'm just going to close that off and don't forget the semicolon and press enter. And there we go. We have now created our very first super simple table using CQL. Just to make sure that has worked, I'm just going to use the command describe key space tabular. So this time I'm picking out the precise key space and putting the semicolon and then just hitting enter. And there we go. We can see that our table has been created, okay, with the book ID, added, author, categories, set, and year. Wonderful. So now that we have finished our table, we have created our table, let's actually get to putting things into our table. To do this, I'm going to use the command insert into. So I'm going to use insert into. That is a command that we're going to use to insert data into our books table. So I'm just going to write the word books. And then once again, I'm just going to put in a book ID, an author, a title, a year, the categories that it belongs to and add it and just click enter. The next thing I'm going to do is actually add the values. So we didn't actually finish off this command. There's no semicolon. So we did not finish off this command. We're just making a new line so it's more readable. And I'm just going to put some values into our books. So I'm just going to open up the parenthesis and I'm actually going to create a unique identifier. So this is a function. I'm going to call this so that it creates a universally unique identifier for me. The next thing I'm going to do is write a string of Bobby Brown as we defined author as text. So this needs to be text. It needs to be a string. And then we're also going to give it a title, which is also text. It is a string. So I'm going to put dealing with tables. The next is year, which we defined as an integer. So I'm just going to put 1999 and then categories, which is a set of texts. So to do this, I'm just going to open up some curly braces this time, and I'm going to put the string of programming and the string of computers. This is because I define categories as a set of text. So I can only put text into this set. Okay. And finally, once again, I'm going to call a function. The function is called to timestamp and I'm going to open up my parenthesis and I'm just going to put in another function. It's called now. I'm going to call it. This will essentially create a timestamp with this very second. OK, so a timestamp of this very second that I'm going to put into my table and I'm just going to close all this off and finish it off with some semicolons because I'm done with this command now and just click enter. Wonderful. So now let's see if that has worked. I'm going to use the command select all. So this little asterisk means all from our table called books. So we have chosen to call the table books. So that's why I'm using the word books here. And then let's get our semicolon and just click enter. And wonderful. Here is our table. We have created a table. We've put some data into our table. Let's have a look here. You will see the UUID has been generated. This is the structure of universal unique identifier. That looks wonderful. Next, we've got added. OK, so this is the function that I wrote two times up now. If I use the function, today's timestamp down to the second has been used to populate this cell right there. And next we have the author of Bobby Brown, the categories and the title dealing with tables as well as the year, which is an integer. Great. So we've created one row in our table. Let's get to adding another row into our table. So to do this, once again, I'm just going to use the command insert into again. I'm going to pick out the table that I created earlier, which I chose to call books. And I'm going to say that into this row, I'm going to put in a book ID, an author, a title, a year, categories and added. OK, and then the values that I want for these cells are going to be once again, I'm going to use the UUID function to create a universally unique identifier for me. I'm also going to put a string of let's put Andrea Agnes as the author 
For the title, I'm just going to put the moon as the title of my book. And for the year, I'm going to put 2001 as an integer, so not a string. The categories, I'm going to put space and non-fiction, non-fiction like so. And then added, once again, I'm going to use the to timestamp and pass through now and call it. Okay, so there we have it. Once again, I'm just going to close that off and then use a semicolon to finish this command and hit enter. Wonderful. So now if we look at everything in our books table, so I'm just going to use the command to select all books. Oops, we didn't use the semicolon. Select all books. Select all from books. Apologies. Select all from books is the command we need. Wonderful. We can see now that two rows exist on our table that we created. Great. This is looking really good. As you can see, a new unique identifier has been generated, a new timestamp, the author name, some categories, a title, and the year as an integer. Great. Now, what if I just want to select one thing from our table? Well, as we mentioned, we know that we can use a primary key to the book ID to do this. So let's go ahead and try do that. I'm going to use the command select all. So once again, select and then we use a little star or asterisk from books. And I'm just going to hit enter. So I'm not going to close off this command yet. And I'm going to use the command where and then use book ID equals. So I've chosen book ID from my cells. I've called it book ID and I'm just going to select a unique identifier. Let's select this one. So what do we expect to return if we run this command? Great. That is correct. We are now getting one item from our table. This is because we chose to select an item by its unique identifier. Okay. So there we go. We have now successfully picked out one item from our table using the book ID or in other words, the primary key. So we have now seen how we can pick out one item from a table. However, how can we filter out multiple items from a table? Well, to do this, we're going to work with partitions. So let's make a new table for this. I'm just going to refresh my page. You can actually also use the clear command instead of refreshing the page. If you want to clear all of this, it's up to you. So once again, this is going to be some great repetition for you, some great muscle memory practice. First off, let's actually get to listing out all the key spaces using the describe key space command. There we go. We can see the key space that we want, the tabular key space. I'm going to use the command use tabula in order to pick out the key space that we want. Next, let's actually get to creating a table in the tabular key space. OK, so we have one table already called books. I'm going to create another table this time. So the command you need for this is create table if not exists. And then we're going to choose to call our table restaurant by country. OK, so I've chosen to call my table this. You can choose to call your table whatever you wish. And now in my table, well, I'm going to decide that I want to have the following columns. I'm going to have the country, which I'm going to define as text. Next, we're going to have cuisine, which I'm also going to define as text, a URL, which again is going to be some text. And now I'm going to have a primary key. So from our previous lesson, we know that we can search for something in a table by its primary key. I'm going to choose to search by the country. The country is actually the partition key we refer to in the explainer. OK, so we have a primary key command and we are passing through what we want the partition key to be, if that makes sense. So what I have done is chosen one of the table columns here. I have chosen country to be my partition key and I have passed that into the primary key like so. 
So now also what is happening is that all my data from now on is going to be distributed in my database based on the value of country. Now, the other values here that I have put, so name and URL, are what we call clustering keys. So what this means is that when I search for data based on the partition key, so in this case it's country, I can make it come back in descending order and URL in ascending order. Okay, so there we go. Let's go ahead and run that command, not forgetting the semicolon, and there we go. Next, let's actually insert some data into this table. So just like before, I'm going to use the insert to command, and I'm going to insert into the table that I have chosen to call restaurant by country. I'm going to open up some parentheses, and I'm going to say that I want to put in a country, a name, a cuisine, a URL, and I'm just going to close that off and then start a new line with the values. So open up the parenthesis again, and I'm going to put the string of Poland. The name I'm going to put Wieska Karczma as a string. And then the cuisine, I'm also going to put some text for this. I'm going to put traditional as a string. And then the URL, once again, this is a string. I'm going to put www.kanchma.pl and close that off and put the semicolon and click enter. And wonderful. I'm just going to insert another row while we are here. So once again, insert into my table name is restaurant by country. I'm going to open my parenthesis to say what exactly I want to put in this row. I'm going to put in a country, a name, a cuisine, and a URL. And in the next line, I'm going to put the values. This time, let's put Singapore. And I'm going to put the shack as a string. This is going to be American food as a string. And the URL is going to be www.shack.sg. And I'll close that off and wonderful hit enter great we can also do a third one so i'm just going to actually press up this time which will just bring back the last line and for the values i'm just going to replace that with united kingdom and for this one let's put the red rose and I'm going to put pub as the cuisine and as the URL, let's just put redrose.co.uk and wonderful. So now click enter and great. Let's check if that has worked. So I'm going to use the select command this time, select all. So the asterisk is all from restaurant by country because that is the table name i want to get everything from the table oops i need to press a semicolon and great there is our table this is looking good and once again let's try getting one thing from the table so select all from restaurant by country so the table name where the country equals the string singapore okay and then just put some semicolons and hit enter. And that should return back the singular restaurant, so the shack, because that has the partition key of Singapore. Wonderful. Now, what do you think happens if we add another row that also has the country Singapore? Well, let's check it out. For this part, I'm going to involve you and I'm going to break to an exercise. So what I want you to do is actually add another line so another row to our table that has the country Singapore, the name of the restaurant, the hut, the URL www.hut.sg and cuisine Lebanese. OK, so go ahead and add one row to our existing table. But before we do that, I'm going to ask you to refresh the page. So go ahead and click that. And wonderful. Go ahead, I'm going to pause here while you have a go at doing this yourself before we carry on together. 
Okay, so first things first, you can of course use the describe key spaces command to list out all the key spaces in your database, or you can just go straight to it if you know which key space you want to use. So I'm going to choose use tabular just like so, making sure that I am in the tabular key space. Next, I'm going to essentially insert a row into the table restaurant by country. So I'm going to do so like so. First things first, I'm going to use the insert into command and I'm going to insert into restaurant by country just like so because that is the name of our table and I'm going to insert a country I'm also going to insert a name. I'm going to insert some cuisine and a URL. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do. And I'm just going to make a new line. So don't put these semicolons yet. Insert into restaurant by country. And then I'm going to put in values. And the values are going to be a string of Singapore. And then the name we said is going to be the hut. The URL is going to be www.hut.sg and the cuisine, which is the one we miss, I'm just going to go back, it's going to be Lebanese, Lebanese. Okay, so let's have a look, make sure that it's all correct. Okay, great, and hit enter. So now we have a look at everything, so select everything from restaurant by country there we go you will see that line has been added a new row has been added so now if we do select everything from restaurant we could actually just press up and then we go where and then we're going to get the partition key so country equals Singapore, what do you expect will happen? Ta-da! We get back the two restaurants that are in Singapore. Wonderful. So that is essentially how you'd group data together in your table and retrieve that group data back. Now, it's time to move on and look at document database types. Document or document oriented database types are arguably one of the easiest types to deal with. This is because they require no schema. So before in the tabular database, we had to define the columns that made up our table. With this, we don't have to do any of that. As long as our data comes as an object, it's fine. The objects are made up of keys and values and look like this. So this is an example of perhaps an item you might find in a to do list. So here you have an object which I have given an ID with a zero, a title with fixed spike as a string, description with a string, and done, which I have in this case given a boolean. But that is not strict. The values can be strings, numbers, booleans, arrays, or even objects themselves. This is called JSON, or JavaScript Object Notation, and is the most popular format for document database types. Now. A group of documents is called a collection. So we will not be using the word tables anymore. It has been replaced by collections. So keep that in mind moving forward. So what are we waiting for? Let's get to it. In this next section, I'm going to make a collection of to do items using a document API. Now, for those of you who haven't heard of the term API, let's do a quick crash course first. An API stands for application programming interface. They allow for technologies to essentially talk with each other and are essential to so many services we rely on today. They are behind most apps we use on a day-to-day -day basis and they can shape the information passed between one technology to another and they connect things such as our cars, fridges, pens or anything really to the internet. APIs are everywhere. As a developer, you might use the Twitter API to get live tweets on your site. 
A map API that will allow us to get data from a third party to use in our new delivery app we are building, or even use them in a two-way stream to get, post, or delete data from a customer relationship management system, for example. There's a reason why these words are popping up, and let's go into why. In this next section, you're going to be seeing these words and using them to communicate with the database you make. In this context, they are called HTTP request methods. The most common are the get request, post request, put request, and delete request. There are others too, but for the sake of the tutorial, these are the ones you need to know. Get essentially gets data, and that's all it does. So imagine you have a client, or in other words, your computer and a server. You are on your computer and the URL, which is where you want to get your data from, is on a server. The client, so once again your computer, sends an HTTP GET request to the server to retrieve the data we want. So here we have a GET request or a visualization of a GET request. The client is requesting the server gives it the necessary resources we need. Then after the server has sent the response, so request and response, we say that we've got it. Thank you. After the server sends a response, it closes something called a TCP or Transmission Control Protocol Connection. We also have post requests and put requests. So here we have a visualization of how the request would work with post requests. So simply sending something to the server and with put request, which are the same. We are sending something to the server, but essentially to edit something or override it. We will go into this in the next section. And of course, a delete request too. A delete request will essentially delete something that is pointed to in our URL or endpoint. So to get interacting with my data, you will see these different endpoints. Simply put, an endpoint is where a resource lives. So with this endpoint here, forward slash burgers, I will get all my burgers. I can also create a burger to the same endpoint. To create a burger, however, I use the post HTT method as we discussed. I can also edit a singular burger, also as we discussed. And of course we have delete, which you guessed it, will delete a singular burger if we provide the endpoint with the ID. Okay, so hopefully this theoretical example has made sense. Let's get to using our knowledge in our project. Okay, the first thing we're going to do is actually create a new key space. I'm going to call this key space document. So I'm just going to go here and save it. And there we go. Okay, so now we've got two key spaces. I'm going to keep the workload separate. So one for tabular and one for document because we're going to be working with document types in this section. So to do this, I'm going to choose to connect to my database using the document API. However, before we do that, we're going to have to get a token in order to communicate with our database. So to do this, I'm just going to go to settings and then under application tokens, organization settings, click that. The role I'm going to select as an admin user and I'm going to generate a token. So this is the token we are going to use. Please, of course, do use your own. I will be deleting this after this tutorial. So just go ahead and copy that and make sure to store it somewhere safe. OK, great. Now, once you've done that, just go back. And this time we're not going to use the SQL console. We're going to use this connect tab. and We're going to use the document API to connect to our database. OK. So all I'm going to do is launch Swagger and this will launch some Swagger docs for us that will be useful in communicating with our database. OK, so this is all pre-made for us. There's not much we're going to have to do. We're just going to have to fill out some blanks. 
The first thing I'm going to do is actually create a new empty collection in a namespace. Okay, so before, as mentioned, we work with tables. Now we're going to be working in collections. Okay, so once again, we were working with tables before. Now we're going to work with collections. So I'm going to create a new empty collection in the namespace and just click try it out. And all I'm going to do is fill out all of these empty spaces that have been created for us. While we are here, it's actually important to note that you can write your own code for these requests. So at the moment, we are on a post request. I'll be showing you how to do this in the project portion of this course. For now, we're just going to make use of this pre-configured UI to help us make these requests. So all I'm going to do is actually put in my Cassandra token in here. So that's the one that we just created. And under the namespace ID, well, we know that our namespace that we just created, or in other words, a key space, is called document. So that's what we put in here, document. Okay, not tabula, document. And next, we're going to have to put something in the body of our request, okay? So we're going to have to put in some JSON with the name of the collection. So all I'm going to do is choose what I want to call my collection, and I'm going to choose to call it my first collection, just like so. Okay, so you've opened up some curly braces. This is how JSON looks. We open up some curly braces. We put the string of name as we were prompted to, and the string of my first collection. Wonderful. So now we can scroll down and just click execute and then wait for our response. And as you can see, that has returned with a status code 201. Okay, status code 201. So that has worked. If you don't know about status codes, there is a really handy website that I'm going to show you with all the status codes that could return. It illustrates them with little dogs and is really easy to understand. This is something that I use quite a lot in my day to day developer life. Okay, so we have now created a collection called my first collection. Let's carry on. Just going to delete all of this and cancel that. And now the next thing I want to do is put something in our collection, right? So I'm going to create a new document to do this. Once again, I'm just going to click try it out. And I'm going to fill out all of these spaces. So once again, let's put in the token that we just created. Next, we need the namespace, or as it's called on our platform, the key space. So once again, I'm going to put document and in the collection ID. Well, the collection that I want to put this in is called my first collection as we just created and in the body in the body, I'm going to put in my first item into the collection. And this is what I want it to look like. OK, so once again, we have the curly braces. I've got the string of ID, which I'm going to give it as one. I'm going to give it the title of make dinner. And then the description of make dinner to apologize for breaking my housemate's bike. And done is a boolean of false. OK. So this is the first document I want to put into my collection. It's just an object that has some information, okay? I can make this information whatever I wish. So this is what my information looks like. Let's carry on. I'm just going to click Execute. And there we go. We get a 201 code and that has responded. We also get a response with this, which is the document ID. So the document we just created, the one with ID one, the one about making dinner, has this document ID. This is its identifier in our collection. OK, great. Now let's get to using this ID. So now I'm going to show you how to do two things. I'm going to show you how to search for everything in a collection. And I'm then going to show you how to search for one thing in a collection. So let's start off with the first one. First, let's search for everything in a collection. To do this, I'm going to just select search documents in a collection. And once again, I'm just going to put in the Cassandra token. Let's click try it out. I'm also going to put in the namespace or key space as it's called on our platform. So I'm going to put in document. 
for the collection, I'm simply going to put my first collection and then I'm just going to execute it. Okay, so I'm just going to scroll down and hit execute. And there we go. We get a status code 200 and we also get the response body. So that is responding with all the data in our collection. At the moment, there's only one item. Okay. So it might be a bit hard to tell. You might think it's just bringing back one item, but it's in fact bringing back all the items in our collection. Great. And now I'm going to show you how to pick out an item based on the document ID. So the thing we created in the part just previous to this. So to do this, I'm actually going to use the document ID. So let's just go ahead and grab that. And then let's go to get a document. Once again, let's click try it out. I'm going to put in the document ID and then I'm just going to fill this out. So once again, the collection I'm looking in is called my first collection. And then the namespace is called document and the Cassandra token. Well, we just need to paste that in and click execute. And great. So we're returning that one item from our collection. Okay, based by its document ID. Okay, so now that I've shown you how to create a collection, add a document to collection, get all the documents back, and just search for one document in the collection by document ID, I'm just going to show you how you would do this in the project part. So all we're going to do, or essentially all that is happening here on this platform, is that we are constructing a URL. OK, so every time you fill out a field, you are constructing this long URL. As you can see here, we've populated it with a namespace, a collection and a document ID. So this is exactly what we will be doing in the project part. We're going to be making a request to this URL, however, with authorization. So at the moment, if I just take this URL and I paste it in the browser, you will get a message that says role unauthorized for this operation missing token. OK, there are tools that we can use to help us if we do want to view this before building our project. One tool that comes to mind is a tool called Hopscotch that I use quite often. And then all you would do, so I'm just going to gravitate to Hopscotch.io and I'm simply just going to create a new request here. So all I'm going to do is put in the URL that we just created, making sure that the method is a get request. OK because we are getting the data and I'm simply going to put the Cassandra token that we have. So the one that we've saved, the really long one in the header. So once again, I'm going to get that token. I'm first actually going to get X Cassandra token so we can identify it. And then I'm going to paste my long token. OK, once again, make sure that this is a get request because we are getting data from the database and click send. Wonderful. So now we get a status code 200 and we also get some response. We get the response body to be the document we have just created. Great. Before we move on, I'm just going to show you how to do one more thing, and that is search for something by a filtered field. So what I can do, I'm just going to go to search all documents again. And in here, I'm just going to add a where string. So this to jog your memory is how we return all the documents back from a database. I can also filter out which ones so I can filter them out by title. So for example, I can choose to filter out. So this is the syntax for filtering out. I can choose to filter out by say title and anything with the title of make dinner will be returned back to me. So once again, I'm just going to do that. That is the syntax for filtering out all of my documents and such for anyone that has the title make dinner or any multiple ones that have the title make dinner and then click execute. And anything with the title make dinner will be returned back to me. OK, great. OK, so now that we have done that, Time for a little exercise. Based on all the learning that we have done so far, how would you go about creating a new item to put in our collection? So at the moment, we have one item in our collection called My First Collection. I would like to add another. So which of these do you think I should go to? 
That's right, I would need to make a post request to this URL and replace namespace ID and collection ID, as well as provide my authorization token. So let's go ahead and do it. I'm just going to refresh this so we can start a new and click here. So once again, I'm just going to click here to try it out. Under the Cassandra token, I'm just going to put in my token. The namespace ID, or as we know, the key space ID is called document. And then the collection ID is called my first collection. And now we need to create our document. So I'm going to create an object for this. I could simply just have an ID like so. Let's give it the ID of two and then a description. And then make it clean dishes after dinner. And if I executed that, that would work. However, I have chosen to keep all my objects the same. That is a personal choice. So let's go ahead and add a title. I'm going to make the same title that I did last time and I will show you why. So there we go, title, description, and then done. I'm going to give it the value of false. That does not need to be in quotation marks. That is a Boolean value that I'm assigning to the property done. OK, so now if I click execute, we get a 201 code with the response body that has come back with the document ID for this document right here. OK, so we've added one more item. I'm just going to add another item. Let's make this ID 10. Let's give it a different title. So fix shoes uh, and take shoes to me fixed with done false. And once again, I'm just going to execute that. So what that means is I now have three items in my collection called my first collection. Two of them have the title make dinner and one has the title fixed shoes. Now, if I wanted to bring back all the documents with the title make dinner, so all of them associated with making dinner, how would I do this? So once again, three items in my collection. I only want to bring back two, and that includes the ones that have the title make dinner. That's right. I would have to make a get request to this URL. So replace the namespace ID, the collection ID, and provide an authorization token. So once again, I'm just going to click to try this out. I'm going to grab the Cassandra token. The namespace ID I want to look in is called document, or in other words, the key space name. The collection ID I want to look at is called my first collection. And this is the syntax for filtering out. I want to filter out by title. And I want to make sure that that title is equal, making sure to put this in quotation marks, equal to make dinner, which is case sensitive. Okay, so that is the syntax. And what do I expect to come back? I'm actually going to set the page size. Let's just make it max 20. So if I had more than two, for example, and I only wanted 20 to come back, this is how I would do it. And then I'm just going to click execute. And there we go. So now we can see that two items have come back to us, this one and this one. And we do not see the item that has the title fixed shoes. Great. And once again, all we have done is generated this URL by filling out all of the above. OK, so what I am doing is there we go. We see the namespace has been replaced. You will see the collection name has been replaced. And if we look where, well, we are looking for a title equal to make dinner. And we only want to bring back max 20 items. Wonderful. So I hope you've learned a lot in this section. Please do pause here. I can't stress enough how much I recommend pausing here and having a play around with all the different requests you can make. So for example, if you want to delete a document or update a document too, please have a play around with that. And once you are done, I will see you in the next section.
In this next section, we are going to look at the key value databases. They are considered to be the easiest database type and usually come looking like this. So you have a key column and then you have a value column. You can actually have as many value columns as you wish. The important thing here is that we can retrieve data back to us, so an entire row, by the key, as that is the identifier in this case. Let's have a quick look at an example of a key value database and how to make one next. Okay, so I'm going to click here and just add key value and click save. Okay, great. So we can now see another key space has been added. Now, this time I'm going to use GraphQL just as a little bit of something different in order to create our key value table. Okay, so this time I'm going to choose to connect using the GraphQL API just purely because we've already worked with the document API. So I'm going to click here and just launch the GraphQL playground just like so. Now, the first thing we need to do when we are here is to create a new table. So first off, I'm actually going to put in my Cassandra token so I'm able to communicate with my database. So I'm just going to grab it just like so. And now you should be able to see the documents populate with all the queries and mutations that we can do. So as I said, I want to create a table. So let's go ahead and do that. This is a mutation as it's under the mutations tab. And to create a table, I'm just going to write create table. I need to pass through the following things. So a key space name, a table name, partition keys and values. So the key space name, I'm just going to put this on a new line. Well, we know that the key space name is key value as we've just created it. Now, the next thing we need to actually do is give our table a name. So I'm going to call this shop inventory, just like so. And the partition keys. Now, if you remember from the first section, our partition keys is essentially the key that we want to filter our table by or search for items in our table by. And it says here that this needs to be an array. So that's what we're going to do. We're making an array. And then what do we want our partition key to be? I'm going to give it the name of key. And I'm also going to define the types that it takes. So I'm just going to put type like so. And I'm going to pass through basic text. Great. So we have our key space name. We have our table name. We have our partition keys. Next, let's put in the values. As you will see, these all have a bang after them, so they are required. Values is not required, but we're going to need it for our table. So once again, I'm just going to put a comma and put in values. And this needs to be an array. So I'm going to open up the array. And I only want uh, another one column. So at the moment, we've got one column, which is a key. The next column I want to have is values. So I'm going to name this value. And once again, I'm just going to give this the type of basic text, just like so. And if we click here, wonderful, we have created our table. Great. So we created our table. The next thing I'm going to do is add uh, keys and values to our table. So I'm just going to go ahead and delete this. And instead of having GraphQL schema, I'm going to have GraphQL forward slash, and I'm just going to put in the key space. So key value, just like so. And wonderful. So now we're in the key space key value. I'm going to use another mutation. So you will see here the mutations and queries have changed because I can do a bunch of other stuff. I'm going to use the insert shop inventory. Okay, so that is what I'm going to do. Insert mutation as this is a mutation. And I'm just going to say shop, insert shop inventory, just like so. And I'm going to use this to insert items into my table. So 
I need to open up some uh, parentheses and then in here, well, I want to pass through a value and that's going to have my key. So what key can we give this? I'm just going to put in a string. As we said, it needs to be text and I'm just going to choose to give it this key. So this identifier, just like so. And then the value of, let's have beans. So what I'm saying with this code is that I want to put in this row into my table that I have just created. And the row will have the key of this and the value of beans. Meaning that if I want to search for beans in my table, I would use this identifier. Okay. So I'm just going to also have to return something so we know this works. So I'm just going to return the key and the value and click here. Wonderful. So now we know that we have inserted this one item into our shop inventory, into our table that we have called shop inventory. Let's just add another item. So I'm just going to make this random once again. And then another item we can put in is shampoo and just click here. Great. So now I'm going to actually retrieve this data. But first off, I just want to show you what this looks like if we use the CQL console. OK, so I'm going to go back here. And under the CQL console, well, I am just going to write use key value because we need to get the key space. And once we are here, I'm going to use the command describe table shop inventory. OK, so we can see here we have added that table. That table exists and exists in the key space key value. And now if I want to grab everything from the table, well, hopefully you remember this from the first lesson, select all. This essentially means all from shop inventory, making sure that I spelled it correctly, inventory. And there we go. We have a table that has a key and a value and we can find any item in our table. So any row by the partition key or the key right here. Great. OK, so hopefully you can see how we can make tables using the key and value approach. Just while we're here, I'm going to show you how to retrieve all the data uh, from our table using GraphQL as well, just in case you are not familiar with GraphQL. This time I'm going to have to have a query, so I'm going to write query just like so. And I'm going to look in the shop inventory. OK, so I'm looking in the shop inventory and what do I want to return? Well, if I just want everything, then I would simply put values, key, value and click enter. And there we go. We are getting all the items from our shop inventory table. OK, so if you want to use this in the project and you want to get all the items from your shop inventory, this is the query that you would use. Wonderful. OK, before we move on, I'm just going to do a little exercise to see if you've remembered what we've learned. So I'm just going to get rid of this. If I want to add one more item into the shop inventory, how would I do this? And what two things do I need to check? Well, first off, we need to check that we are in the correct URL. OK, so we need to make sure that the URL is pointing to the key space. In this case, it's key value because that is what I call my key space and that I also have my Cassandra token in the header. OK, so those are the two things you need to check. And once you have checked that, we can write a mutation. OK, not a query. A query essentially retrieves back data and a mutation adds data, deletes data or edits data. So for this, because we are adding a new item into our shop inventory, I need to write a mutation. And that mutation is insert shop inventory because I'm inserting into the table called shop inventory. OK, and what do we need to put in here? Well, we need the values of key and value. And what are we going to have as the key? Well, once again, I'm just going to put in a random string like that as an identifier. And the value this time, I'm going to put 
I don't know, Coca Cola. Okay, great. And just to check this has worked, I'm going to return the values of key and value. I could technically just return one, it is up to you. And just click here. So now because that has returned, we know that has worked. Brilliant. Now, how do you think, and this is something we haven't covered, so this is going to require you to have a little bit of a think based on what I've told you. How do you think we would delete an item from the shop inventory? Well, that's right. Because we are changing the data, we're going to have to find a mutation that will delete from our shop inventory. And because we find stuff by the partition key, so this, we are probably going to have to delete an item by searching for this key right here. So let's check it out. So I know this is going to be a mutation and I can also look in the docs to find the delete shop inventory mutation to help me out. So that is a mutation that I need. Delete shop inventory. And I'm just going to pass through the values of I'm just going to grab this one right here and I'm just going to return the value of key. Okay, and that should have worked. Let's go have a look here. And once again, I'm just going to shop list out everything in my shop inventory and amazing. So we added the Coca-Cola and then we deleted the Coca-Cola too. Great. Now, if I was to say try delete something by the value, so let's go ahead and put shampoo and then just return the value, we will get an error. This is because we cannot delete by the value. We have to delete by the primary key, which we set to be the key. Okay? Wonderful. So I hope you've learned a lot in this section and I'll see you in the next one. In this next section, we are going to look at graph databases. Graph databases are a great way to store data that has relationships between other pieces of data, or in other words, nodes. Each node is connected by an edge to represent this relationship. Think, for example, your friends on social media. Here is you and here are three of your friends. So you and your friends are nodes and the connection you have is represented by this line, or as we are going to call it from now on, an edge. Easy, right? But wait, your friends can also be friends with each other. So how would we represent that? Well, by adding more edges to represent the relationships. And as your friendship circle expands, the more complex it can get. So that is the simple idea behind how graph databases work. Let's see it in action. In this section, we will be doing an overview of an already existing demo graph database. The GitHub repository for following along will be given to you in the description below. So once it gets to that, please go ahead and find it below. Okay, so this time we are not going to be using the Datasax Astra interface. We're going to be using the Datasax Enterprise Graph. Okay, so let's go to it. For this part, you're going to have to have Docker installed. So please go ahead and download Docker. If you don't have it already, install it onto your machines. Okay, so once you have it installed, it should look something like this. All you need to do when you're here is just click the settings and make sure that the CPU, the memory, the swap and the disk image size are all around about these levels. OK, so that is what you need to do. Make sure that you have at least two CPUs. So here you see you have eight and at least three gigabytes or RAM. So these are the settings you need. Once you have them, let's carry on. And once you have that done, I'm just going to ask you to get up your terminal and then in whatever directory you wish, please write the following command. So please go ahead and write the command docker network create graph and click enter. So what you should have is this long ID right here. Okay, 
So once you have that, we are now ready to carry on. This is your identifier for the graph. The next thing I'm going to ask you to do is clone this directory. So this is a directory I will be putting at the bottom in the description. So just clone the Datastax Devs Workshop Introduction to NoSQL and click Enter. Now, I already have that in here, so I'm just going to go into the directory CD Workshop Introduction to NoSQL. And once we are in here, we are free to start the container. So what I'm going to do is docker compose up D and then wait for that to open up in the local host 9091. So this will take a while. Please feel free to pause here, have a break, and let's get back to it once all of this is complete. Okay, great. And now let's go ahead and visit localhost 9091. Okay, so this is an example from Datastax itself. Please feel free to use it and adapt it as you wish. And there we go. So this is what you should see. Here is the example that is given to us from Datastax. Let's go ahead and first check our connections. So I'm just going to click here and on connections, it's going to click on this one right here and just make sure that this is on DSC. OK, so this essentially is pointing to our local Cassandra. So once that is done, let's test it out. And great. So we are connected successfully. Let's carry on. Now, let's go back to here and just click on this example one like so. Now, you will see that you're prompted to create a graph. So let's go ahead and create our first graph. I'm just going to keep it as studio tutorial graph like so. So just leaving all the default settings. OK, and I'm just going to click create. Wonderful. Our first graph is now created. Now, if we move down here, you will see a language called Gremlin. OK, this is the language that we are going to use for this tutorial. It is essentially another query language. OK, so we've looked at SQL, we've looked at CQL, and now we have Gremlin. It is a graph traversal language, OK, and it has been developed by Apache Tinkerpop of the Apache Software Foundation. With this language, we are essentially creating schema. OK, so just like we have been doing, you will see here that we are adding a schema called God and we are giving a partition key. In this case, it's going to be the name, which is some text. And it also has a property, which is age, which is an integer. And we are creating it. We are also creating a demigod, which has the same partition, a human, again, which has the partition key of name, a monster, a location, and a titan. Okay, so here we have the code in order for us to essentially create our first graph all about gods and demigods and monsters. So I'm just going to click here to run this, so run this in real time. And wonderful. That has been a success. So now if we look down to here, you will see some more code, again in the language Gremlin. So just like we created labels here of God, Demigod, Human, Monster, we have now also included edges. So these edges are essentially how each one is going to be related. So this edge is called Father, so this is going to show us a relationship of father and son or daughter. And then also we have mother and brother too. And it will also give us the direction. So a god is essentially the father of a demigod, but also can be the father of a god if someone is a titan. Okay, so that is how that looks. Let's carry on. If we move down, we can see more edge labels. Okay, so we can also write a relationship of who's battled who, as well as father and brother. We can also do where someone lives or if someone's a pet and so on. And finally, we can actually add items to our graph. So this is how you would add some items into a graph. So for example, here we are adding Saturn, 
We are saying this is a Titan, we are giving it the property name of Saturn and we are giving it an age of 10,000 and so on. And we do this for all these other items as well. Okay, so there we go. We are defining the items and we are defining the relationships between the items or in other words, the edges between the nodes. And finally, we can have a table of what this looks like as well. So here we can see this in table format, but what is more interesting is the graph view. So this is essentially what our information looks like once it has been graphed out with nodes and edges. So the edges symbolize the relationship. So if we have a deeper look at this, we can actually click on these and it will give us more information. So for example, this is a monstra hydra. You will see the name it has is hydra. You will also see it has the label monster. And by its node, you will see that it's battled the monster Serbius. Okay, so there we go. This is a great example of how grass can really illustrate information in a, an amazing way. Now, this has been a lot shorter than the other tutorials. This is because I just wanted to show you how you can work with graph databases. It will involve learning the Gremlin language, but I think this is a good place to start in order to get your head around it. So I'm going to leave this information to you. I'm going to put the link in the description and please do have a go at getting this up yourselves and having a play around with it as well. So if we want to add one more thing into our database, we can do it right here. And just don't forget to run it. So now, because there isn't much of an exercise here, I'm just going to give you a pop quiz. When working with graphs, what would these be called? So these right here that I am pointing at, this little red guy right here, these monsters, and this god. These will be called nodes. And what connects the nodes? That's right, edges. So once again, these are the edges. And if we actually gravitate over them in this UI, it will give us the relationship between each node. Okay, so as we can see here, we have a little house. The location is the sky. And then this is where Jupiter lives because he loves the fresh breezes. Wonderful. Okay, so I think we are done with looking at graphs. To power this down, I'm just going to run a command. It's going to be docker compose down and just hit enter. Great. So that is all four of the database types. I think we're now ready to move on with some projects. Now that we have covered the four main database types, I want to quickly talk to you about the multi bottle type. In this course, let's actually recap what we've done. Well, we created a database, right? And in it, we stored the key value pairs as per the first tutorial. After that, we stored JSON documents in AstroDB as per the document type tutorial. We then stored data in tables as per the tabular tutorial section two. And finally, we stored graph data. So that's a variety of different data models all stored in one place by the graph one. All of this is possible because AstroDB is actually a multi-model NoSQL database. You can use the same database to store a variety of data models. But what is cool about this is that you also only need to learn and maintain one database, which makes your job easier. Learn one database and use it to solve many different problems. Okay, wonderful. Now, hopefully through the explanations, examples and exercises, you are now feeling a lot more confident in not only understanding the different types of NoSQL database types, but also how to use them. If not, don't worry. I have two short real life projects that we are going to build in order to show you how you would interact with your databases when building JavaScript projects. By using a data API gateway like Stargate IO, Cassandra and AstroDB, developers can opt to use a GraphQL, REST or a schemaless JSON document API as an alternative to CQL. Let's do it. Okay, and let's get to it. In this project, I'm going to be showing you how to use the document type as well as the document API in order to create our first project. This project is going to be an app which will show you all your favorite burger restaurants. 
okay? So let's get to it. I've actually started with a fresh board, so you'll notice there are no key spaces, and we're going to have to go ahead and create our database again. So I'm just going to go here, and let's call our database project work, and our key space baggers. And then once again, I'm just going to have to create the area that I am in and create a database. Wonderful. So you will see my database is being created and you will see the status is pending. I'm just going to wait for that to be active so that I can go ahead and start using it. And wonderful. The status is now active. Let's go ahead and use our database. So to do this, I'm just going to double click in here and you will see the key space name of burgers. Now let's get to adding some data. I'm going to do this thanks to the document API as stated. So first off, we need to create a token. So I'm just going to click in here and the role I'm going to choose is admin user and I'm just going to create a token. Once again, please make sure to keep this token safe. I would strongly recommend saving it somewhere useful. Okay, so once we have that, let's go back to this documentation right here. Let's go ahead and launch the Swagger UI. So I'm just going to go ahead and click that, and these should populate in front of you. So we have a lot of options here and a lot of endpoints. If you remember from the tutorial, the one I need first is this one right here. We need to create a collection in order to store our data. So I'm just going to go ahead and click that and click try it out. Once again, I'm just going to paste the Cassandra token in here so that we can essentially communicate with the database. And then let's go ahead and choose the namespace or in other words, the key space we want to create our collection in. As we have just created it, this is fresh in my mind and I know that the key space name is Baggers. Wonderful. And in here, we just have to pass through an object that has the name and then whatever we want to call our collection. So I'm going to call this burger info, just like so. And I'm just going to click execute. And great, we get a 201 code. We've made a request to this URL with our new authorization token and the status code we got back was 201 or in other words, let's have a look at the status docs again, or in other words, 201 for created. Great. So now that we have created our collection, what's the next thing we need to do? The next thing we need to do is add some documents into the collection. So I'm going to go ahead and do it by selecting this one right here. It is a post request to this URL. So once again, I'm going to choose to try it out. I'm going to paste in my Cassandra token. The namespace or the key space ID that we want to communicate with is called burgers. The collection ID we just created is called burger info. And then the body is essentially the document that we want to put into our burger info. So I'm going to choose for my document to look like this. I'm going to give each restaurant a name. So for example, Bob's Burgers. So that is a string. I've chosen to give it the string of Bob's Burgers. I'm also going to give it a description description and I'm going to say tasty burgers from a fictional character from TV. So we've got the name, we've got description, we can also have ingredients and we can do this if we wish as an array. So in here, I'm going to put a patty, so beef patty. 
I'm also going to put tomato. Let's also put some cucumber, some lettuce. and some cheese, okay? So those are my ingredients. I don't only have to put strings in here. I can also put an array of strings if I wish, okay? And one last thing that I wanna show you is, okay? We can also have Boolean, so I can have visited and I can have true. And then I can also visited have objects within objects so if i put location like so as a property i can have an object as a value so that is also an option um, let's go ahead and do that so i'm just going to open up my objects and in here i can have so location address and then have that to be a string if I wish. So 45 lavender drive. I can also have a, let's do zip code, which is an integer. So I'm going to make this up. And then I can also have the web address. So this is just going to be www.bobs com, okay just like that so we have a string here we have a string here we have an array of strings we have a boolean we also have an object which has an address a zip code as an integer and a web address as a string now let's have a look and see if this is working. We could also give it a unique ID if we don't want it to count from zero. So perhaps let's go ahead and do that. I'm just gonna go ahead and maybe let's start from 340, why not? Okay, so now let's execute this and great. Our first document has been created and we also get a document ID that has been assigned to this object right here. So we have one, let's go ahead and add another. So I can just do so from here. Let's go ID 341. This time let's go Matilda's and Matthew's Manhattan Burger Joint. And then let's change this up. They have a tofu patty, tomatoes. Let's have a pickle. So pickles. Let's also have some lettuce. And then we can have brie. Visited, I'm going to put as false. And the location, let's change this up. So I'm just going to put in a random location. Let's put Denver Avenue. Zip code, once again, I'm just going to make this up. And then let's put M and M progress. And just click execute. Great. So we have two documents in our burger info collection. Let's just add two more. So I'm just gonna change the ID again. And then let's have Gertrude's place. Hipster hangout in the city as the description and I'm going to have a beef patty let's have perhaps something else here so coleslaw pickles lettuce and there's cheese let's have cheddar visited I'm going to have as true and the location let's have 103 Darlington drive once again, just make up the zip code. 
go prudesplace.com and just click execute. Let's go ahead and just add one more. So there we go. And then let's have fancy burgers, a new location for burger snobs. Let's have a beef patty. Let's also have a onion ring in this one, some pickles, some lettuce, and let's just have some generic cheese visited. I'm going to put as false location. I'm going to put one Walter Street. Let's make this up and have fancy burgers dot com and click execute. Great. So now we have four burgers in here, but let's just double check this has worked. So to get all of our burgers back, I'm going to search documents in a collection. So I'm just going to go here. This will be a get request as I'm getting the data. I'm just going to paste in my token right here. I'm going to look in burgers as that is what I called my key space. The collection ID is called burger info. And then I'm going to say that I'm going to have a max of 20 come back and I'm just going to click execute. And there we go. We can see all four of our burgers coming back to us. Great. So that is exactly the data that we need. Now let's get to using this in a project. So essentially what I want to do is build a project in which I'm going to be making a request to this URL right here and passing through my authorization token. So let's do it. I'm just going to go ahead and open up WebStorm. So I'm going to get up my WebStorm project and I'm going to say this is a React project. So let's call this Burger App just like so. And I'm going to use the create react app command in order to build out a react project for me all configured so we can go. So I'm just going to click create. And as you can see, that command has sprung into action and I'm essentially just downloading all the dependencies, fetching all the dependencies and packages that I need in order to get the boilerplate for my React project. Of course, if you're not using WebStorm, please go ahead and get to this point as well. All you need to do is create a project in your directory using the command npx create react app. Great. So now that we have that, let's get to it. So as you can see here, the NPX Create React app has essentially populated all this for me with the following packages and written these following scripts. OK, so these are the dependencies that have been installed and these are the files that have come with Create React app. So if I actually run this, I'm just going to go ahead and click NPM start like so. This is essentially what should show up on localhost 3000. OK, so that is something that you should be seeing right now. If I go ahead and actually delete all these files, so I'm actually going to go ahead and just do some deleting. So here is our app. This is essentially the spinner that we saw. So you will see here the spinner is this right here. I'm going to go ahead and delete all of this like so. Um, if I actually just go hello, I'm going to show you how this looks. OK, as you can see, that is working. So that is updated. So I'm just going to delete this for now. I don't need the logo, so I'm actually going to get rid of that. I don't like to use semicolon, so I'm just going to delete that. And I like to use functional expressions. So I'm just changing this as this is my preference, but you are free to keep it as uh, as you wish. 
So there we go. We don't need the logo, so I'm just going to go ahead and delete that from this project. We don't need the report vitals, so I'm going to delete that. Delete anyway. Let's delete the tests as well, as we're not going to be writing tests for this project. And let's delete this test file too. Okay, great. I don't also need, I'm actually going to delete the CSS file as I'm going to be doing all my CSS in this index CSS file. So I'm going to delete this. I'm just going to put all my styling in one file for this project. So there we go, there's our app.js file. And if we look in here, we don't need this as we've just deleted it. We don't need this as that is now non-existent. And once again, I'm just gonna get rid of the semicolons like so. Okay, wonderful. Let's just check we didn't break anything and this is looking good. Let's get my console log out too. Okay. So now that we have a blank slate, let's get to actually getting our data. So to do this, I'm going to have to create a little mini backend. So just in the root of my project, so on the same level as git ignore, I'm going to create a new file, just a new file like this, and I'm going to call it index.js. Okay. So there we go. This is essentially going to be my mini backend in which I'm going to build a backend using Express. So first things first, let's decide what port we want our backend to run on. I'm going to decide that I want my port to run on 80,000, 8,000, sorry. And we're going to have to install a few dependencies for this. One of them will be Express. So we're going to use Express for this project. I'm use require express. So I'm just going to get up my terminal and install express like so. I'm also going to need cause Morgan uh, node fetch so we can do fetching in the back end and dot env for storing secret variables. Okay, so please go ahead and just install these dependencies and I'll talk you through them as we use them. Okay, so I'm just going to leave that to install and let's go ahead and just uh, actually use them in the back end of the project. So require the package cause and then const morgan equals require morgan. Morgan is actually a package that we're going to use in order to, I'm going to show you what it looks like. So I'm just going to go npm. Morgan, it's essentially going to help us debug the backend better and make everything a little bit more readable. So this is the package if you want to have more of a look. It's essentially a little logger that will give us more information when we use it. And once we do use it in our project, so once we do essentially uh, do this, so we're using the package or storing it as Morgan, we've done the same, we then need to pass tiny into Morgan. Okay, so this is essentially what is going to let us debug better. So as you can see, I've got the package and I'm storing it under the const Morgan and I'm just going to use Morgan and pass through tiny so we can use the logger better. Great. So we've got Morgan. The next thing I need is a package called node fetch. And this essentially works sort of similar to the fetch API and will allow me to make fetch requests on the backend. So just like that, that's how I'm going to use fetch. Just to be sure that everyone is using the same packages, please be sure to be using these packages that I have right here. There could have been updates, so to prevent any issues, just make sure that these are the ones you are using. Or if you're in doubt, please feel free to check out my GitHub project that I will share with you in the description of this video below. And finally, we also need uh, the .env to so the .env package will allow us to read secrets from the back as well. And this is how you would initiate it. Okay. So all I'm doing is actually getting this from the documentation. I'm doing this from memory as I've used these so many times. But if we search here,
here we go as you will see all I'm doing is taking this and using it in my project in order to use the .env package uh, whoops please spell that correctly .env okay great so this is looking good now let's initialize express so the package that i have just imported and stored as express i'm now going to initialize like so so now if i use app like this i can use morgan tiny in my back end I can also use cause. This will essentially stop me from having any cause issues. I will show you what I mean by this when we get to building our app a little bit further. And then I can also use express JSON. Okay. And this will essentially allow me to read the JSON in a way that I can use it in the back end. Once again, I will show you what happens when I don't use this. Okay, so just make sure to have all of these like so and all this boilerplate done so we can start coding. Okay, so please pause here, make a note of this. I'll make it a little bit bigger so you can see everything a little bit clearer. Once again, things to remember are please do make sure your index.js file is in the root of your project. Okay, so on the same level as package JSON. And then this is the boilerplate setup that you need in order to get going with our backend. So the first thing I'm going to do is get all the restaurant data. Okay, that is the first thing I'm going to do. And I'm going to show you how. So to do this, I'm once again going to use app like so. So app is essentially uh, what we saved express as the initialized express as and now I'm not going to use use, I'm going to use get. And what I'm going to pass through into here is an endpoint that I'm going to choose. OK, I'm going to choose this by myself. I want to say that if I visit localhost 8000, so I'm just going to open this up in a new tab. If I visit localhost 8000 forward slash burgers, I essentially want the burger data to show up. OK, so that's what I'm writing here by putting forward slash burgers. I'm deciding that this is where I want my data to populate. OK, great. So that is the first thing I'm going to do before we get going. Actually, let's uh, listen out to see if the server is working. So this is how I would do it. Once again, you use app. This time I'm going to use listen. So not use and not get. I'm going to use listen. I'm going to listen out to port 8000. And if it's all working, I'm just going to console log out. Server is running on port and then whatever the port number is. OK, so this is looking good. Let's also write a script for this because we don't have at the moment. So I'm just going to go in here and start front end. So I'm going to keep that script, but I'm going to say start front end needs to be written in order to start our app, start our front end. And I'm going to add a new script. So this time, if I start back end like so, then I just want to run the backend. So that's the command to do so. OK. Great. So let's go ahead and I'm going to stop this from running. I'm going to change the script to start front end and run it. OK, so the front end should have started and now I'm going to open up a new tab. Oh, OK, there we go. So that's just rerunning. Let's go back to our project and now I'm going to open up a new tab. So new tab in our terminal. And this time I'm just going to run this command that I have written. So npm 
run start backend. Okay, great. And I'm just going to comment this out for now. Comment this out for now because we are not using it. And there we go. Okay, server is running on port 8000. So this is looking good. Um, obviously, at the moment, we don't have anything coming back. So I'm just going to continue with this. So if we visit this endpoint, what do we want to do? Well, we want to fetch the data. So for this, I am actually just going to don't have a request or a response. Let's just have it in here for now and we might change that later. And then Okay, actually, let's just get rid of it. So we'll just have a function, a callback to be precise. So we're passing through a callback and then we need to essentially fetch data from the URL. So if I just save this as URL for now, I'm going to make this a little bit smaller. We essentially want to fetch data from this URL right here. So I'm just going to copy that. I'm going to paste it as a string like so okay so that's all i have done for now okay we will be tidying this up but this essentially is what this looks like at the moment so there's our url now i need to make a get this is a get request so let's go ahead and do that so now it's time to use fetch so fetch takes a url okay which is essentially this and we're also going to have to pass through our cassandra token okay so, or our authorization token so i'm going to do this along with options so let's define our options so const options like so and in here where well, we know that the method is a get method okay and we also need to pass through some headers so the headers that we need to pass through, we need to accept this like so as a string. And we also need to pass through the X Cassandra token. Okay, so we need to pass through essentially this just like we are passing it through. Okay, you'll see this is part of the header. Okay, so essentially what is happening behind the scenes here, we are now coding out. So I'm just going to, once again, as a string, post my token, okay? So now when we make a fetch, let's just uncomment this out now. When I fetch, I am passing through this URL. We are fetching data from this URL. It is a get request, and we are using this in order to pass through our Cassandra token, okay? Great. So we are making a fetch. And this is going to return a promise. So I then need to chain it with the then keyword. The response It's going to be the response JSON. And this is also actually going to return a promise. So we need to chain it again. And this time, I just want to get the JSON. OK. So great. Now we do actually need to pass through a request and response. So let's just do that now. Okay, so whatever's coming back to us, we need to view as JSON and then let's catch any errors. So I'm just going to catch the errors by console logging out any errors that return so we can see. Just like so. Okay, so there we have it. There's a lot of tidying up to do, but let's first make sure that this works. Just make sure that is in the string itself. Cool. So let's give it a world. Now, if I visit localhost 8000 forward slash burgers, this is the endpoint that I have chosen. Ta-da! you will see all my four burgers show up.
You will see each object has its own document ID as well. Great. If you're not seeing it in this format, it could be because you don't have a JSON view extension added. This essentially will make your, your JSON much more readable. Okay, so if you don't have that, please go ahead and add the extension now. This is what it should look like. Okay, wonderful. So we have our data coming through. Now let's get it into the front end. But first, I'm just going to tidy this up real quick. So we don't need this anymore. We could keep that as it is. The URL. So essentially what we are doing is passing through the key space, which is burgers, and passing through the collection name. Okay, so you could save it uh, as separate things and pass it through. So for example, I could save key space as the name burgers and then pass it through into here with this syntax like so. So I'm just going to go burgers and then make sure that these are back ticks. So there we go. So that is an option too if you want to make things. Oops, sorry, that should be keys. What did we save this as? Key space. Key space. So that is an option if you want to make this more readable. Or you can, and this is what I'm going to choose to do. Because we are not going to be changing this. It's pretty much going to stay as it is. I'm just going to get the whole URL. Just like so. And I'm going to save this as a secret. So I'm just going to go in here and once again on the same level, I'm going to create a new file. I'm going to call it .env. Okay. And now I'm going to save this in here as endpoint. So just like so. And I'm just going to paste it in here. Just like that. So there we go. And now to access this right here, I'm going to use process env endpoint okay so this wouldn't work if we didn't uh, have this package and didn't use it just like so and now i think we have to rerun this let's just check that out okay no that seems to be working as it is great so we've saved our url as a secret back here one other thing that i'm going to save is my astro token okay so there we have it. And once again, I'm just going to save all of this. I'm just going to grab that as it is and use process env and then whatever we called it in our astra dot env file is what we need to call it here. So let's save that and I'm just going to paste that in here like so, okay, great. And that seems to be working just fine. Okay, so we've cleaned this up a little bit. We've got our URL. We're passing through the URL and the options into fetch. And great. One thing we can do is write some middleware. So if I write function not found, and then we pass through the request, the response, and next. And then in here, if we get a 404 status, so let's go back to our status dogs. Okay, so you will see that 404 means not found. So if we get a 404, well, then... I'm going to create a new error and that error is going to say not found. So we're just making debugging a bit easier with this. We're going to get the message that says not found. Okay, so that is what we are going to do. And then if it's none of these, I'm going to move to the next function, which is just an error handler in general. And it's going to be less specific and error handler. Uh, I'm going to pass through the error to so this error right here and then the request and response. 
and this time if the response if the status code is whatever the status code is so whatever it comes back as or 500 so any error or sorry any status code or 500 then I want to send a message that is whatever comes with that status code. Okay, so there's two ways of doing it. So I'm just gonna show you what this means. Okay, so now let's get to using it. So once again, I need to write app use and I'm gonna use the function not found. And I'm also gonna pass through the function error handler just like so. Okay, so what I've written means that if I say misspelt this URL, if I wrote burgers like that, I get the message not found. I get the error message not found. However, if I didn't have this, so I'm just going to comma that out and I go to here. Oops. It's actually all of these. See, it just says cannot get burgers. It doesn't really tell me why. It doesn't give me enough information. However, if it's not found, so 404, I'm essentially telling it to show me an error that says not found. Okay, so that is how we do that. And then any other error, we get a different error message. So we essentially just get the error message that goes with these status codes. But this way we can be more specific. So I can go, hey, you are in the wrong place, buddy. Hey, you're in the wrong place, buddy. Okay, so cool. Just going to put it back to something more general. Okay, so we are getting all of our burger data. Now let's get to using this in the front end of our project. So once again, these are all the packages that I have used or the dependencies I've used. Just make sure that you're using the same versions. Okay, great. Now, let's carry on. So essentially for my front end, so we can shut down the back end now. In my front end, I essentially want to get all the data from this URL so we can use it. So let's go ahead and do that. To do this, I'm actually going to import another package. So I'm just going to get up my terminal and I'm going to install the package Axios. Okay, this package is essentially going to help you make the uh, requests and fetch the data. So let's go ahead and do it. I'm going to write a function right in here. So uh, a function to get the data. I'm just going to call it const fetch data. Like so. So this is a functional expression. And this is actually going to be an async function. Now, to fetch the data, I'm going to use Axios. So let's import Axios import axios from axios once again this is the package that i am using of axios so import axios from axios and now i'm going to use axios and i'm going to make a get request to get the url this url right here so, okay so because our backend is running that should work of course if our backend stops running then we will not be able to get this data and this uh, we need to use a wait as that comes back with a promise and let's save this as burger data just like so so this should get the data and now i'm actually going to uh, save this so I'm going to use use effect so const uh, burgers set burgers if you haven't used um, use state sorry use state is the one that we're going to use and we're going to use this to set the state in our app so of course we have to import it so I'm going to import that just above here import use state 
We're also going to use use effect, so I might as well just import that too, making sure to spell it correctly. From React. Okay, so there we go. So essentially, if I now use set burgers, so at the moment our state for burgers is null, but if I use set burgers, I can set burgers to whatever I wish and I want to set it to the burger data just like so okay so let's check this out let's see if this is working so what I now need to do I'm just going to use use effect for this and I'm going to pass through a callback function that will essentially fetch my data just like so. And I'm just going to pass through an empty array so that this doesn't keep on fetching over and over again. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's see if that has worked. I'm going to console log burgers and see what happens. So let's go back to our front end. So localhost 3000, just inspect the page a console log out and there we go so this is what burgers looks like now we actually just want the data so we're going to go into the burger data data and there we have our four burger objects great so i'm just going to go ahead and do that so burger data 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 and let's see what that looks like now Okay, great. So there we have it. We actually have an object of four objects. Cool. So this is looking good. Um, there you go. As you can see, there they are with their ingredients and locations and so on. I'd actually like to make an array out of this so it's easier to work with. So I'm going to show you how to do that. So just here is where I'm going to change this into an array. Let's actually just save this as data this time. And I'm going to get the burger data data. And for each one, I'm going to... So let's get the object keys for it. So I'm going to make some object keys for it because at the moment it doesn't have anything uh, to sort of differentiate each of the objects and I'm going to map so each burger object I'm going to turn into I'm going to grab it uh, from the burger data 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 and I'm going to turn it into put it into an array Okay, so now whatever comes back, I've saved that as data and that is what I'm going to sa save as my burgers and there we go. So we now have an array of four objects, each with an object key. Wonderful. Um, I wonder if I do need these object keys or if that will just work without it. No, we do need, we need the object keys. Okay, so that's what we are essentially working off. So there we go. Wonderful. So we have our four burgers. Now let's get to actually displaying them in the browser UI. So let's do it. So for this in here, I'm actually just going to create a data going my favorite burgers. The styling for this is going to be extremely minimal as we have a lot to go through and I don't want this to be all about styling. I want you to actually learn how to retrieve data into an actual project. Okay, so I'm just going to do this. I'm going to create a div and this is going to be the burger feed. Let's maybe give it a class of burger feed, just like so, burger feed. And in here, well, I'm just going to create a card and this is going to take our burger data. So let's actually map over each card. Let's actually create a card first. So in here, I'm actually going to create a uh, folder or directory called components. So new 
directory and it's called components. And then in here, I'm going to create a new file and just call card.js, just like so. And then let's create our card. So const card, and then I'm going to return. At the moment, I'm just going to return two tags like that. And I'm going to use export default card in order for us to use this card, okay, in other files. So now in here, I'm going to import the card, import card from, make sure to get the path correct. So in here, components, is that right? Yeah, okay. And then card.js. Cool. We actually don't need the JS, so this is fine. So now we've imported the card and at the moment we aren't passing anything through into the card. However, I can actually style this up. So let's go ahead and I'm just gonna give this a class name just so you can see what's going on a little bit further. And I'm gonna say card. And now in here in my style sheet, anything with the class of card, I'm just gonna give a, let's give it a height for now of 200 pixels a width of let's say 80 view width and a background color of uh, what color should we go corn flower blue border radius 40 pixels okay so at the moment i've just put in a card so there we go that is uh that is my card now if i map all my data onto this, okay, onto each card, it will actually produce as many cards as I need. In this case, it's gonna be four. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm just gonna pass through some props into this card. So I'm gonna pass through, well, first off, maybe let's just map uh, so let's get our burgers map. I'm going to map for each burger and I'm just going to get that and card and I'm going to pass through the burger data. Okay, so this is looking good. As always, we should probably have a key with this. Uh, let's just see how this is looking. So there we go. We've created four cards as we have four burgers. Let's actually add the key prop as well. So I can, as the key, just use the burger ID as we do have one. So let's go ahead and do that. Okay, so we are creating the burgers. Let's maybe give each burger some padding as well. So margin even margin for pixels just so it's a bit more space out and on the card itself well, we're passing through the burger so i'm going to destructure the burger like so otherwise we'd have to get the props so i'm just destructuring the burger and then let's make this maybe a little bigger i'm going to so in here Grab that, add each of these. So let's give them an H2 tag. Let's pass through the burger's name. Let's see what that looks like. So there you go. You will see the burger name is being shown just right here. What else can we pass through? We can pass through the burger description. Maybe let's make this a P tag. So there we go. And then we can also pass through as much information as we wish. So maybe let's put in another P tag and call this burger. What did we have? Location. And then burger location address. Okay. burger location uh, web I think that was one of them or was it just website 
the website. You can always check what it was. Go in here, we've got the description, we've got the name, description we've got visited, we have location, it's web, okay, address, web, zip code. Probably don't really want the zip code, so I'm just going to keep it as web. Okay, so there we go. And then we could also hide it if we've uh, been there or, you know, which would mean we'd only see the ones we haven't. But that is completely up to you. Okay, in fact, I'm going to do this. So if burger visited is true, then we want to return back. Um, I don't know what we can return back, just sort of freestyling here, uh, a div that has the class name visited otherwise or we could just go if it's not visited there's probably neater ways to do this uh, I am just freestyling here at the moment as I've said and we can do not visited and it will show based uh, it will show this div if we visited it and this one if we haven't visited it so then I can go visited and just style it up and if it's visited, I can just give it a green or a red, actually. Let's make it red. Height, 30 pixels. Width, 30 pixels. Border, radius, 15 pixels. Background color, red, as we don't want to see it. And if it's not visited, we'll give it a green. Okay, and let's make this Okay, so there we go. We know that this means we visited and the green means we have not visited these ones yet. You can replace this with icons. I just wanted to show you one way of doing that. Wonderful. Um, okay, so this is how you would get data using the document API and also using the document type. Okay, I'm just going to start this up a tiny little bit before moving on. Padding, let's give this 30 pixels. Let's make all the font white, font color white. Of course, please feel free to, uh, you know, take this project, really improve on it. Go crazy on the styling because that part, my friends, is up to you. This is not a styling course. Uh, whoops, cannot. Okay, so we just have to... What is happening here? I'm just going to comment that out for now. Okay, so it's not picking stuff up in here. This is because sometimes the burger data might not come back fast enough. So I'm just going to put uh, that right here. OK, good. OK, so it might not read it first time. So the first time this renders, the burger data might not exist, which is why we put this question mark here. And when it re-renders, then it will show these cards. OK, great. So this is looking a lot better. Great, and then I'm just going to override the font if there's an H1 tag and give it the font color black. Cool. And let's just go back here, put that back. Wonderful. And one last thing I'm going to do, and that is center everything. So on the body itself, I'm going to do display flex. Justify content center. And 
and text align center. Great. So wonderful. I hope you've learned a lot. Once again, this code will be available to you in the description. If you're watching this in the future, some of these packages might have changed. Just make sure to use these same packages for this project. Wonderful. Thanks for watching and on to the next project. In this project, we're going to learn how to use the GraphQL API in order to build out a hotel app. Okay, so once again, I'm going to start completely from scratch in order to build out our React app. First things first, I'm going to create a new database. So hopefully you are familiar with these steps already if you have been following with this tutorial. So what should we call our database this time? Let's go ahead and call it whatever we wish. So I'm just going to call it project work again just like so. And let's call our key space name hotels. The next thing I'm going to do is just select where I am at the moment. So I'm going to go ahead and let's pick Europe and West Europe and just create a database. Okay. So there we go. There is our database. It is currently being created. You will see the status as pending and we're just going to essentially wait until that is active in order to start working with it. And there we go. So let's go ahead and click into here. And then here we will see our key space. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is just head over to the connect tab in order to start working with our GraphQL API. We are going to be using this documentation right here to help us. So the first thing that we need to do is just create a new application token. So I'm just going to click here to do that. And once again, I'm going to select the role I want. I'm going to choose admin. However, there are many others with different readability levels, and I'm just going to create a token. Once again, I'm just going to copy this right here and keep it somewhere safe. Now, once we have done that, I'm just going to close that down and I'm going to launch the GraphQL playground by clicking right here. So there we have it. There is our playground. And in order to communicate with our playground, we need to just put the token we have just created in the HTTP headers, just like so. So now we can communicate with our database. Let's go ahead and create our first table. So I can use the docs to help me with this. So this is the mutation I'm going to be using. Once again, if you watch the tutorials, you will know that we have queries and mutations to our disposal. Queries will essentially find data for us and mutations can create, delete and update data for us. So we need to create a table. So I'm just going to get rid of this. And this is a mutation. And the mutation that I want is create table. Now, if we look under here, you will see that to create a table, I need, so the bang indicates that this is necessary. I need a key space name. So let's go ahead and pass that through a key space name. I'm going to put this on a new line and the key space name has to be a string. So I know that my key space name is called hotels. OK, because that is the key space that we named it right here. So if I go back to my databases, hotels is the key space name. And then the table name, this is something that I'm going to assign right here. I'm just going to call it hotel data. So I have just chosen to assign this to the table name right now. The other necessary thing that we need is the partition keys as an array. So let's go ahead and add that partition keys as an array. And I want my partition key. So if we just click on here, I need to give it a name and a type. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. I need to give it a name, which is a string. So I'm going to choose to sort all my hotels by a ID. And then I also need the type and the type I want this to be is actually going to be basic text. 
as I don't want this to be an integer, I want the ID to take letters and numbers. Okay, so that is one column that we have made so far, the partition keys. If I want to add more columns, however, I could do so thanks to values. So once again, values is an array. So I'm just going to my values. And if this is one column, this is actually the column we are going to filter by and search by. And all these additional ones are going to come back if we search for this column. So let's add another column. Again, we need to have a name for this, which is going to be the hotel name and the type for this. I know that I want this to be text. And if we want to add more columns, so at the moment we have one column, a second column, and I'm going to have three columns in here. So this is actually going to have the rating. So I'm going to call this rating and I'm going to give this an integer value. OK, so there we go. So now if we run this mutation, great, we have created our table. Wonderful. So now that we have created our table, let's get to adding data into our table. So all I'm going to do is navigate into my key space. So as you can see here, Datastax has actually generated the URL for me. I need to go into the hotels. So I'm just going to go up here and instead of GraphQL schema, I'm just going to go forward slash hotels to make sure that I'm in the correct key space. OK, so there we go. And now instead of creating a table, if I look at the docs, they will be changed. I need to insert hotel data. So now this is the mutation I need. Once again, it's a mutation as we are going to be inserting data. So let's get up mutation. And this time I need to use insert hotel data just like so. And what do we need to put in here in order for this to work? Well, I need to put through a value. OK, and that is necessary. That has got a bang there. So we have to do it. I'm going to give it a value. And this time I'm just going to give it the ID. I'm going to make up an ID. I'm also going to give it a name. So the name of the hotel, let's say Abby's Hotel and a rating, which is an integer. So I'm going to give it a four out of five. So let's just actually put this on different lines, just like so. And let's just return back the value of name to check this has worked and click run. So great, we have just inserted some data into our table. OK, uh, let's go ahead and just insert some more. So I'm just going to change these around a little bit. This time I'm going to call this Satori's. Give it a rating of five. There we go. That has worked. Let's give, make another ID up. This time it's going to go Motel Maze. Give it a rating of three. And then one more. And this one is going to be awesome hotel and give it a rating of five. Great. So now we know we have just added four hotels into our database, but how can we actually see this? Well, for this, we need a query. So to query this, I would simply, I can go here and have a look if I need the queries I need is hotel data. So I'm just going to write hotel data like so. And because we are not filtering out by anything, I can just get the values and then choose whichever values I want to come back. So I can get all of them. I can get the ID, the name and the rating and just click that. Or I can just get the name and ID. So that would return back or I could just get the name, whatever you wish. So however you write that query is what will return back to you. I want everything, so I'm just going to do that. And there we go. So that is essentially the query that we need in order to get all of our data from our database. And we also need this Cassandra token as the HTTP header and also this URL. 
as that is where essentially our data lives. So let's go ahead and do it. Let's start up our project now. So all I'm going to do is get my WebStorm up and just create a new project. Once again, this is going to be a React project. So I'm just going to use this and I'm going to call this Hotel App, just like so. And using NPX Create React App, this should create a project for me with all the React configuration ready to go. So I'm just going to click this like so. And there we go. You will see my hotel app project right here and all the dependencies being installed ready for me to use. Of course, you don't have to use WebStorm if you're using another code editor or IDE, that is absolutely fine too. Just make sure you get up to this point where your project is installing all the dependencies ready to go. And great, we are ready to go. So the first thing that I'm going to do is actually just delete anything we don't need. So here are all the files that have been generated, as well as the package and all of its dependencies and scripts. So in here, I'm actually just going to get rid of the logo as we are not going to need this anymore. So just delete that. Delete anyway. I'm going to delete the report with vitals and set up tests. So once again, just delete that as we don't need it anyway. And then I'm going to delete the app CSS file as I want all my styling to be in the index CSS file and just delete the app test.js. So just delete that like so. Okay, so this is looking good. Just going to minimize that and delete this as we don't have any more. I'm going to delete the semicolons as I'm not a fan of semicolons. There we go and save that. And then in the app.js file, I'm going to delete all of this as we don't need it anymore. And once again, get rid of these semicolons and we don't need the logo as we don't have it. We don't have this file either. Okay. So this is looking good. Now, if we run this, I'm just going to click this to run the start script. You should see the project show up here. We've got rid of all the styling, so you should just see a blank slate like so. And let's get up our console log. Wonderful. So now that we have that, let's get to making some requests. So I'm just going to minimize that for now. In the previous project, we built a little mini backend using Express. However, this time I'm just going to show you a different approach and that is using Netlify serverless functions. So to do this, let's get up our terminal and let's install uh, the Netlify command line interface so we can use it. So npm install netlify cli and I'm going to install it globally. Okay, so that is what the G is for. That is to install that globally and just let that run. Okay, so I'm going to leave that to do its thing. The next thing we're going to do is actually create our first serverless function. Okay, so when that is done, I'm just going to ask you to create a file in the root of your project. So make sure it's in the root of your project on the same level as the package JSON. I'm just going to minimize that new. And the file is called netlify toml. Okay. And in here, I'm just going to give you some code to put in in order to build out the serverless functions. So this you can just copy. These are some commands that we're going to have to put in here in order to build them out. Functions here is essentially the uh, whatever you call the directory you want to store your functions in. So let's go ahead and create that. I'm going to create that on the same level. So just make sure that's in the root of your project and call the directory functions just like you did here. OK, so that is where we're going to store our functions, our serverless functions. And then we just need one more. Command. OK, 
So there we go. Make sure to write this exactly as I have written it in a Netlify TOML file in the root of your project. Great. So now that we have done that, I'm going to create my first function. So making sure you are in the functions directory, create a new JavaScript file and call it whatever you want your function name to be. So I'm going to call this get hotels. And this is a JavaScript file, so that will add the JS extension. Now, with any serverless function, Netlify serverless function, this is the syntax that you need. So let's go ahead and write it. I'm going to have to write export handler. And this is an async function. Maybe let's make this a little bit bigger. I'm going to pass through an event. And then we are going to have to essentially fetch some data. So just like we did before. So we're going to import uh, another directory. So we're going to get node fetch. I'm just going to install it right now. MPI node fetch and let that install. Okay. So while that is installing, let's go ahead and use it in this file. Const fetch equals require node fetch just like that now as we know with fetch we need to pass through two things and that is a url and options that will have our http header along with the authorization token so let's go ahead and do that so once again, let's write the URL and we know that the URL, so let's go back to here, is this right here. And this is where we're going to make the request to. So I'm just going to paste that in here like so. And then let's also get our options. So const options. Say this is const URL and the options are going to have a method which is a get request and the headers okay the headers which will consist of the content type Oops. content type and the x Cassandra token. Okay, so there we go. I'm just going to make this the same as we see here, X Cassandra token, and I'm just going to grab that. So the whole thing and just put it in here, just like so. I'm just going to make it single quotes. Great. So we have our options and then we also have our URL. Just going to format this a little bit better. So URL and options and we're going to use fetch. However, this time we're actually going to save uh, whatever comes back from fetch. So we know this comes back with a promise const response. So whatever that returns back, we're going to save as response this time. And this is not all we actually need to do. And because this time we actually have a query to pass through. Okay. So we do have a query to pass through and that query is, I'm just going to save it up here. So I'm going to save it as const query and I'm just going to use backticks for this and I'm going to paste in my query. So let's go in here. This is essentially the query I want to make. So I'm just going to paste that in here like so and maybe format it a little bit better. We need to pass that query through in with the options. Okay, so this is no longer a get request as we are posting. We are sending this query. So make sure to change this to a post method. And let's get to passing through the query into the body. So I'm going to pass through the query, but I need to pass it through JSON stringify and then just pass through the query like so. Okay, great.
Great. So that is looking good. We are now passing through the query in with our options. So along with the Cassandra token, the method, and then we are putting that into the fetch that we imported from node fetch. Great. Now we're going to use try and catch in order to do this. So this is the syntax for try and catch. We've got try and then we're going to catch any errors. So E for errors. Okay. And to try do this, we actually have to make sure this is all in the export handler. So let's just grab that and make sure that it is here. We are going to well, essentially we're getting the response. So I'm going to call this response body. So we could use this, but we also need the JSON from it. And this returns a promise. So I'm going to have to use a wait in front of it, just like so. Okay. And then if that comes back, then we're just going to return a status code of 200 because that has worked. And then we are going to show in the browser the response. So I'm going to use JSON string five for this to work. I'm going to show the response body in the browser. And if it doesn't work, well, we catch the errors and we're just going to console log the errors. Okay. We can also, of course, return a status code too. So I'm going to do return status code 500. And I'm just going to show the error in the actual browser too. So let's use JSON string five and pass through E for error. Okay. So this is looking good. Before we clean this up, let's just check that it works. So to do this, I'm just going to go in here and I need to run the command netlify, netlify dev and let it do its magic. Okay. So there we go. Localhost 888. Let's inspect the page. And now if, if we want to get that data, if we want to run this function, essentially, I need to go into functions and get hotels. Okay. Oops. Make sure this is an S. So I'm going to go forward slash dot net lify forward slash functions as that is the directory that we created and then get hotels. And wonderful. So now we are getting all of our data and wonderful. So it is saying something's already running on port 3000. I thought I did shut this down, but I didn't cancel. Okay. So we need to stop that running. Just make sure that's stopped. Okay. Essentially what is happening here is that localhost 888 is now our front end. Okay, so we don't want anything running on localhost 3000 because we want everything to be running on here. Okay, so that's what we want. And to, and essentially our front end and our back end are now on this URL. So here we go to get our data. And here is our front end. Great. So I hope that makes sense. Once again, just make sure that Netlify dev is running in order to get that to work. Wonderful. So once again, I'm just going to show you the package JSON. These are the packages that I am using. If yours have changed or if you're watching it in the future, then please use these for the tutorial in order to get this code here to work. Okay. So there we go. Those are the packages that you need along with their versions. Wonderful. Now that we have our data, let's get to cleaning this up a bit. So just like we did before, I'm going to create a new file, a .env file in which we're going to store all our secrets. So once again, I'm just going to put the endpoint in here and I'm also going to put in my Astra token. So just like that. And then from here, I'm just going to get this URL to get the whole thing. And put it in here and I'm also going to get my token. Okay. So there we go. Just like so. It doesn't need to be a string. We can just save it like that. 
Okay, and now this means I can use process E and V in order to get my Astra token. And I can also use it to get the URL. But now it's hidden, okay? So now it's a bunch safer. End point. Great. And we have to actually inject these variables, otherwise this won't work. So I just inject the variables by running Netlify dev again. So just like so, okay? And you will see injected endpoint and injected Astra token, okay? So there we go. Let's try that again, only absolute URLs. Endpoint, endpoint, endpoint. Ah, I misspelled endpoint. Okay, so once again, I need to re inject the token. So Netlify dev. And wait for that to rerun. And wonderful. So now we have a URL that will get back our data as long as the back end is running. Let's get to using it in the front end. So I'm done with this for now. Let's have a look if this needs any cleaning up. So here we have all the code that is necessary. This will be available to you below, so please make sure to use it. We don't actually need to pass through an event for this. This is looking good, okay? So there is all my code. Great. Now let's move on to the front end. So here is my front end. Uh, as you can see here, once again, I'm going to have to essentially fetch the data. So I'm just going to do fetch data just like we did before. I'm going to make this an async function. Okay, let's change this to a function expression just because I prefer working in this way. And now let's actually fetch the data. So now this time I am going to actually use fetch. So the fetch API, I'm going to await it as it's going to come back with a promise. And I'm just going to fetch this URL right here. So I'm going to copy that and paste it. However, we don't need all of this. I can simply put forward slash Netlify functions get hotel. So that is essentially the same thing. OK, so we're getting the data from there and then let's go ahead and save it as something. So I'm going to save it as just the response for now, const response. Great. So that's the line we need to write. Now, once we have whatever comes back from us, so the response, um, we need to get its JSON. However, this also returns a promise, so we need to use a wait. And let's save this as response body this time. And we're going to have to actually save this into state. So I'm just going to import use state and also use effect, as we're going to need it later, from React. OK, awesome. So we've got the response body. Let's actually save it to the state of the app. So let's use what should we have hotels set hotels and then use state. I'm going to start off with the state being null. OK, so all this means is that at the moment hotels is null and I can use set hotels to make hotels whatever I wish. But at the moment, we're starting out with hotels being null. So this gets passed on to that. And I can use this to also change that. So I'm going to use set hotels to change hotels to the response body. Wonderful. I think let's check out if this has worked. So I'm going to now use use effect. And then a callback function. If you don't know about use effect, I would suggest uh, doing some research on these hooks at the moment. So use effect just like so. I'm going to fetch the data. OK, and then I'm just going to put up like an empty array so it doesn't keep fetching that data over and over again. So I'm going to call that. And now let's console log hotels to see if this has worked and to see what is being returned back to us. So 
So now let's go back here and just go to the front end. And there we go. We are getting the response body data, data, hotel data. So data, hotel data values is what we need. And that is an array. So I'm just going to go back here and go response body data, hotel data values. Okay, in order for that to bring back just the array. And there we go. We have an array of four hotels. Wonderful. Let's carry on. So now that we have that and we have checked that that has worked, so there's the whole code in its entirety, please feel free to stop here and make a note of it or just catch up. Press pause and if you're caught up, let's carry on. So just like we did before, I'm actually just going to map out all the hotels. I'm not going to create a card component this time as you know how to do that. So I'm just going to grab the hotels if they exist and I'm going to map so dot map. And for each hotel, well, I want to return a div. Let's give it the class name of hotel. And then in here, let's put an h1 tag that has the hotel name, a p tag that has the hotel, what were the other ones, hotel name, then we have a hotel rating. So let's see how that looks. And there we go. We get all four of our hotels with a little rating too. Now let's get to styling this up a little bit. So here is my app. I'm just going to get my CSS file. Let's put everything in the body as justify content center. But of course, we need to use display flex to initialize this and align text, text align, apologies, text align center. Okay, so that is looking good. And anything with a class of hotel, I'm going to make sure that the background color is salmon and border radius is 50%. Okay, so maybe that's a bit too much border radius. We can, of course, change it. Let's maybe make it just 10%. Hmm. Or well, whatever, really, that you wish. It is up to you. Great. So, of course, uh, please, again, feel free to go wild on the styling. I don't want to go too crazy on the styling. This is not what this is about. This is a tutorial to show you how to get data into a project. OK, so I'm just going to put my hotels here and maybe let's make this in each two tag like so. Great. And maybe let's give it some padding. Uh, from the top, let's give it 10 pixels. And from each side, I'm going to go 50 pixels. Should make it look really long. Okay. And then also margin 5 pixels. Great. Okay. So hopefully you've learned a lot in how to get data, this time using GraphQL and the GraphQL API. If you want to learn more about how to make more advanced requ requests, so in making the functions, including stuff like pagination, I do suggest watching my Netflix clone in which we use GraphQL to do this. OK, so that is an option for you. Please try. Go ahead and watch that if you wish. It is reviewed by an actual Netflix engineer, too. Once again, the code for this project will be available in the description below. And that's it. So to recap, during this video course, we have learned what is NoSQL, SQL versus NoSQL and why you can't compare them, 
types of NoSQL databases, so document databases, key value databases, wide column stores or tabular databases, graph databases, and talked about the multi-model databases. We also talked about how to get data into projects with two real life examples and also had a look at the document API and GraphQL API as we did this. So an action packed course really. And if you're looking for ideas on where to go next to really solidify your knowledge, I would recommend using the document API and SDK to build your own TikTok app with me here or using the GraphQL API to build a Netflix clone here or even learn how to federate data from two database types with my GraphQL Federation crypto app right here. Thanks so much for watching and I will see you again soon.